Hello students, what we're going to do today in this video is we're going to get a titration setup going uh, for a sample. And so what we're going to do is I have a simulated stomach acid here that I've made. And we're going to say that we really wish we knew what the concentration of this stomach acid was. And so in order to do that, we're going to perform a titration. And I have all of the equipment here. A major component of a titration is this long piece of glassware that we call a burette. And the burette is going to allow us to very accurately deliver a certain volume of a solution into our sample here. So in order to get the setup going, this is a burette clamp. It's very common that they have two different clamping sides to them. Notice that I put the, the middle part of the burette clamp down the ring stand. And then there's a little piece here, a little spring-loaded piece where I can hold the burette. Now there are certain labs that you might do where it's nice to have two separate burettes and so it's common to see another one over here, but we just need the one. Okay, now the burette has a little device down here where a little valve that I'm going to be able to open and close and we'll get to that in just a moment. I have pre-washed this and rinsed it with the actual chemical that I'm going to be using. So you put your chemical in, you rinse it a little bit uh, so that you don't have any leftover water or anything that might accidentally dilute your sample. And what, I'm going to put my 0.1 molar sodium hydroxide up here in the burette. To properly do this, you want to have something that you can pour very effectively with. And so I have a beaker with a nice lip on it. I'm going to take into my hand, the taking it off of the ring stand, and I'm going to take into my hand the burette. And I'm going to go ahead and start pouring very carefully and slowly. If you pour too quickly, you can uh, spill over here, and that ends up making a big mess, especially if you have some tricky chemicals that you're using. OK, something to note. I have poured in to my burette, and I have not tried to reach all the way to the top here. So it is considered best practice that what you should do is you should get the, the titrant, we call it, the solution, very close to the top so that you have a lot that you could potentially use. But don't try to nail it. Don't try to hit that mark right at the top there. It's considered more accurate if you just pour it to wherever you get and then make a measurement after that. So you're going to have a little trouble seeing this. Imagine that this is still clamped in here. The number readings on this, they start at zero up here, and the numbers get larger as you go down. So make sure you're calibrated to that. I also have a black surface here. So if this were truly clamped in and vertical, you don't want to have it being held like I'm doing right now. But sometimes the black in the background here can help you get a good reading. And so what I would do is I would get my initial reading at the bottom of the meniscus, that's that curved part of the solution. And remember, you can always measure one digit better than the minor scale division there. Okay, so now that I have my burette securely sitting inside of the burette clamp, let's go ahead and prep my sample. So I'm going to maybe not do this quite as accurately as I want you to do. I'm just trying to not take too long with the video here. So this is some acid, so I'm nice and gloved, and I've got my glasses on here. And I have predetermined that I think I want about 10 milliliters of sample. Okay, now that I have my 10 milliliters, what I'll do is I'll go ahead and pour into here. This graduated cylinder that I'm using is a two-contained device. It contains the appropriate amount that I was trying to measure. It does not to-deliver, though. So there are some drops back here of my sample. If I was trying to be really, really precise, what I would do is I'd go get some DI water, and I would rinse this a little bit and pour that in as well. If you think about and understand the titration, I have put a very some um, number of moles of sample into here. And just because I rinsed with deionized water doesn't mean that I'm adding more moles of the actual sample into here. So even though that volume creeps up a little bit from the rinse water, it's not influencing my actual data that's about to arrive here. Okay, so now I'm gonna change the camera angle a little bit so that you can see a few different things here. 
Okay, I think I like this camera angle a little better for you to be able to see what's going on. So I already have my simulated stomach acid here in my sample. And what I'm going to do now is I'm going to add my indicator. So we're using a very common pH indicator that's called phenolphthalein. This is going to turn from a clear color under acidic conditions, and this is quite acidic right now, and it's going to turn pink under basic conditions. And it's going to become basic uh, when I've added a sufficient amount from my from my burette here. So we're going to pause for a moment and try to make sure we truly understand what's going on with the chemistry. And then we're going to come right back to this. Okay, now let's take a pause and let's look at a little bit of the theory here. And so over on the side, I just have a quick little picture to remind us of what's going on. So I have sodium hydroxide that is in my burette. We refer to that as the titrant that's up here. It turns out that the only thing I really care about for this particular reaction is the OH minus, the hydroxide. And so I'm just showing the hydroxide down here in a net ionic reaction. Down here in my sample, I had a bunch of excess H plus. That is the acidic part of my simulated stomach acid. H2I is what I am calling the phenolphthalein. That is the indicator that is sitting there. But the indicator is down here with the H+. So two different ingredients down here, and I'm putting in a reactant. What's important to understand for a titration, in particular this one, they can all operate a little bit differently. But we are going to be adding the OH-. There are two reactions of interest that could occur. I'm going to have what I'm going to refer to as the primary reaction. OH- is going to react with H+, and it's going to neutralize. It's going to make water. That is going to happen preferentially. So thermodynamics will let this happen first. Um, or at least it's the more stable reaction. My secondary reaction is going to have my OH minuses reacting with the indicator here. And the indicator initially is clear, and these H's are actually trying to show little H pluses, hydrogens, protons, that are sitting on this giant molecule that's over here. Don't worry too much about the, the coefficients being twos and whatnot, but what's important to understand is that once I have some OH minus interacting with the indicator, this reaction will occur, and this is the new species associated with my indicator, and it is pink. So what we do when we're doing a titration is we're trying to find the perfect match of our sample, which is down here, and the titrant on a mole basis, on a number basis. So we have to deal with number of moles. And so I want to just walk through what this might look like. I'm going to just make up a number here. I'm going to say that I have 50 H pluses down here. This is not a number I would actually know in it in advance. I don't know how much is down there. That's the whole point of the titration. But if you allow me to go through this thought process of what we're about to do, I'm going to be adding some of this from above. Let's imagine that I started with my 50 and I add 10 of these. Well, they're going to react with each other. And what's going to happen is I'm now going to have 40 of these. These have now been reacted away. And then I would have created 10 of these over here on the other side, OK? This tells me that I still have plenty of sample down here. I need to do more. Let's go ahead and add another 10. So I'm going to come in here, and I'm going to add another 10. That's going to react over here. So these 10 react with the remaining that are over there. I'm down to 30, OK? These are now gone. And now this is moved up to 20, OK? The whole goal is we're trying to get this down to zero. Let's say that I add 29 more. And so this is going to go down to one. So if you follow, I have one of these left. These have now reacted away to get me down to one. And I now have 49 of these. Okay, I'm getting close. At this point in the titration, these are starting to be few and far between. And what you're about to see is that when I start adding more OH, the primary reaction is not always going to be the thing that we see happen. Sometimes those OHs are going to come down here. And they're going to find their next nearest neighbor to react with, and it might be the indicator. And I might make some pink, even though I still have some sample here. But these are called reversible reactions. And what's going to occur is I can have my 
reverse reaction occurred. This is the less stable one. This is not going to win in the long run relative to this reaction. So even if I come down here and some of the OH minus reacts with the indicator, makes a little bit of pink, give it enough time and some of this can go back, recreate the OH minus, that OH minus will then preferentially go find an H plus and do the original primary reaction. But what's interesting is you're going to start to see some pink formation that's occurring even though I still have some sample. Then when we get right to the end, and so now we're trying to put in that last drip, what I'm going to do is I'm going to add one more of these. And so I'm going to add one of these. It reacts here and here, and now I am seeing 50 of these. So now my sample's gone, and I still do not see any persistent change on my indicator, though. It probably got pink, and then it went back to clear, but this is where I'm at, and I have now used up all my sample. If I add one more of these, so now in total, if you're tracking, I have added 51 in total once I've added the one more. Now my one more is going to come down here. There's no more primary reaction to do. My one is going to react down here on the secondary reaction, and I'm going to go find some of my indicator. And then I'm going to go over here, and I'm going to be a persistent pink. Only now that I've added extra of this can I see the persistent pink that's going here. Okay, so hopefully we understand that we only want to put a very small amount of indicator in here. So I just put a single drop in there, and I'm going to hope that that's enough for me to see a clear color change. I've put my my Erlenmeyer back under here. You can see I have a white background. This is going to help me identify the color change when it happens. And then I'm ever so slightly going to lower my burette so that the tip of the burette is just beneath the level of the glassware here, the rim of the Erlenmeyer. I happen to be right-handed, which makes it easier for me to swirl with my right hand. So I'm going to use my left hand on the knob. And so I've already opened this thing. I would have, of course, already taken my initial reading from the top of the burette. Okay, so as I'm adding this, I'm starting ever so slightly to see a little bit of pink arising. That is the little localized area where I am starting to react with the indicator. But then the pink goes away as that secondary reaction gives, gives way to the primary again. And so remember, that's a reversible there. So this does help me understand that I need to slow down a little bit. So I'm adding in smaller increments here. And I'm looking for how long is this pink going to persist. And so I'm adding a little bit more. The pink is still going away relatively quickly. And so I'm going a little bit faster again. When you are doing these for the first time, I'm going to recommend that you go slower than I'm doing. I'm just trying to make sure that the video is not too long here. I'm adding a little bit more. It's persisting longer now. I don't know how well you can see that in the video. But that pink is lingering a little bit. That's starting to make me think that I'm getting closer. One strategy that you'll see people do is I'm going to do a half turn of this. I'm just going to go bloop. That was a 180 degree turn and I get a little burst of, of pink in there. And I might just do that again. I'm just over and over. I, I am able to see that this thing is getting pink when I do this. So I'm going to keep doing this. That pink is starting to linger a little bit longer now. So I put it in there. You can see that almost stayed. Now, we don't consider ourselves finished with our titration until we have a persistent color change down here. So now that I really think I'm getting close, what I'm going to do is I'm going to start just watching. I'm watching the tip here very closely. And I'm going to just try to get like a drop uh, to go through. Boy, I think I got really lucky with you guys in that my drop that I just put in, I think, actually got me to that persistent color change here. So if you look, you, sh you should hopefully be able to see that it's a little bit pink in there, and it's a persistent pink, OK? I always tell my students, if you're not sure if you have hit the end point, what you should do is go measure this final volume up there and assume that that is actually your end point. Write that number down and keep going a little bit if you want to just increase your confidence. So 
this is starting to clear a little bit. It is actually possible that maybe I do need one more drop in here. And so let me go ahead and add another drop. Okay, I get a little bit of, of pink that came there. This feels like it's a little bit more of a powerful pink than even before. So maybe, maybe I now have the confidence that I'm going to say, no, wait, actually, this is my endpoint. And so I would go re-measure my, my final volume from up there. I think we are done with the titration. This is where you would pack it up, maybe do another one. Okay, I just want to end the video on this particular page again. So remember, what we did is I kept adding. Initially, I was definitely always doing this primary reaction, but as the reaction proceeded, I started to have a few of these OH minuses that would come down and find a secondary. But there was still some H plus around. And so even though I saw some pink temporarily, it would come back. Those OH minuses would then go permanently find one of these H pluses that they could uh, interact with. As I got fewer and fewer of these, this secondary reaction became more and more probable. And so the pink was getting more consistent. But I was not convinced that I had finally taken care of all of the H pluses until I saw that persistent change. So now what you do is you go figure out exactly how many of these guys did I add. And we would do that in moles. And if you figure out how many moles of OH minus you, you have, you will be able to explain how many moles of H plus were down here. And then maybe we would take that number of moles back into molarity. But that'll be the calculation part associated with the chemical reaction and the titration. Hopefully that was useful to everyone.